everyone. Well, welcome you to today's colloquium. Uh, my name is Rhonda Fritz. I'm from the College of Education. Today, I get the pleasure of uh, introducing Sarah Ralston as our speaker. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sarah, and um, then she's going to share with her, us her research, followed by a little bit of time to ask her some questions. So welcome. I'm so happy you're all here, and um, it's fun for us to get together and celebrate the research that everyone's doing across campus. So this is a great, great opportunity. So Sarah grew up in, on the central coast of Cal California and received a Bachelor of Arts in French from the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara where her research papers were criticized for lacking current sources. <laughs> she didn't learn how to use an academic library properly until she was a 31-year-old graduate student. Um, she received her master's degree in library and information studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2009 and started teaching here at EOU in 2010. Um, though 80% of her job is instructional, teaching information literacy classes and doing course-integrated instruction in the disciplines, she also enjoys collaborative projects, and I've had the pleasure of being on several of those with her. Um, lots of fun. And productive <laughs> committee work that allow her to engage with faculty and staff across the institution. So please welcome Sarah Ralston. Thank you. So for those who don't know me or who don't know a whole lot about what I do, um, I am an instruction librarian, as Rhonda said, and that means that I primarily teach. So about 80% of my workload is teaching information literacy um, and activities related to information literacy instruction. And that takes the form of library credit courses like Library 127, Library 307, discipline-specific um, course-integrated instruction. So that would be going out into other people's classes and doing instruction that's catered to a specific assignment or to specific objectives in that class or in that discipline. Um, and I am also involved in teaching our integrated first year experience course, Uni 101, which has information literacy outcomes and which I co-coordinate with Kathleen Brown. I want to clarify my, my title slide here um, to be clear that what we actually looked at, the research that I'm going to be sharing with you today, is the information literacy skills, abilities, and knowledge that students bring with them to the university. So what they know before they come here, before we have a chance to teach them anything about library research or information literacy. I'm going to give you a definition for information literacy. I know a lot of you are familiar with that already, but just for those who may not be, just so that we're all on the same page, I'll give you a little background on our study, so how we conceived of it and how we implemented that study and where it came from. I requested some information from the Office of Institutional Research that I thought would provide some valuable context um, to look at along with our findings, so I'll share that with you. We're also going to take a look at the Oregon School Library standards for grade 12. So the idea is that if we look at what students should be able to do by the time they graduate from high school, we can compare that with our findings, what we saw them actually being able to do. Um, there are a couple of other very similar studies that used the same survey that we use, so we can do a comparison of EOU students um, and students from a couple of other different areas. And then I'm going to conclude by sharing a vision for information literacy instruction moving forward. This is a lot of text, but this definition is really important, so I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. This is the definition of information literacy according to the Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL. So that's our professional organization. So it's the professional organization for academic libraries. And they define information literacy as the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So that has a lot to do with being able to access, find, and select information resources. But it's also about being able to think critically about how information is produced and how information is disseminated. Um, really, in a nutshell, I would define information literacy as critical thinking about information. That's really the more important part to me, rather than the skills-based being able to search 
being able to come up with keywords and things like that. A little bit of background on our instructional program. So Pierce Library has an instruction team that's made up of the um, five library faculty who are involved in instruction in one form or another. And we really drive that instructional program. So we come up with goals for the program. Um, we create the objectives and outcomes for that program. We're always looking at what are we doing? Is it working? How could we maybe do it better? What are some current changes in the field or trends we should be looking at that might, infect or might affect how we do instruction and so on? So in 2012, most likely at the instigation of Sally Milkey, who's our instructional, uh, instruction team coordinator, we wanted to look at student skills when they come to the university. So we wanted to do a pretest, basically. Um, we already had a sense of what students can do and cannot do because we teach, and so we pretty much know. But we wanted to be able to test if what we knew was actually accurate. And then we wanted to be able to document these deficiencies that we are commonly seeing in students' abilities so that we can better advocate for our instructional program and look at how we might do better or might get more opportunities to do information literacy instruction on this campus. So um, we came up with a survey in probably spring of 2012, and we implemented that in 2013 in the fall in the first year experience courses. For those who are not familiar with our first year experience courses, which looking around, I think almost everybody probably is, but for those few who may not be, we have two first year experience courses. So in 2012, 2013, we had Hume 101, which is a one credit course for students who test into college level writing and math. Um, and then we have Core 101, which was a three credit course, is a three credit course for students who are considered underprepared. So they're testing below college level writing and math writing and or math, I should say. In 2015, the Hume 101 course, the one credit course, was replaced with Uni 101, which is a three credit course. It has many of the same outcomes that Hume 101 had in terms of um, getting students acculturated to the university environment, um, getting them connected with resources and faculty and staff, study skills, time management, a lot of those soft skills that they're not necessarily getting in other classes, but it also has the addition of information literacy. And so that really forms the core of that class. And it's co-taught by library faculty and facilitators who come from advising and student affairs. Our instructional program in 2012 was aligned with the Association of College and Research Libraries, so ACRL, their standards for information literacy competency. That was the guiding document of our field at that time. And so all of our program goals and objectives and outcomes are aligned with um, those standards for information literacy competency. The survey that we used, so we took a survey that had be been created elsewhere um, by Diane Mittermeier and Diane Quirion from the University of Quebec in Canada. We modified that survey which was also aligned with the same information literacy competency standards. So that allowed us to look at our learning goals and um, align the survey questions to our, our instructional program. In 2015, we had a shift in our field. And so in 2015, those competency standards were re, uh, retired and replaced with the ACRL framework for information literacy. And that's the document that guides our work now. And that really signaled a paradigm shift in information literacy instruction that moved from a skills-based approach to a more conceptual approach. And that change, um, it changed up a lot of things for us in terms of you know, how we view our role and how we view information literacy instruction. But it also prompted me to take a look at this survey data that we had been collecting for four years, which the survey we were using might be a little bit out of date since it was aligned with that old document. Um, so it prompted me to take a look at that, collate all of the, the responses across the four years, analyze that data, and then bring that forward to share. So that's how I spent my summer, is putting all of that together. I did ask for some information from the Office of Institutional Research um, because I thought that that would help inform some of the findings. 
Um, you can see by year, so in 2013, we had 371 total first year students, so our incoming class of first year students totaled 371. And I wanted to get those totals so that I could calculate my sample size, but I also asked for some other demographic information that I thought would be informative. In that first year, we got 110 survey responses. So 29.6% of that incoming class. Um, the first year that we did this survey, we basically emailed all of the Hume and core instructors and said, can you please have your students do this survey? Um, so we got what we got. In 2014, we had a little bit of a competition. We added an incentive, so we got more responses that time. So we had 45.8% in 2014. And then by 2015 and 2016, now we're teaching the uni courses, and so we were able to conduct the survey during class time in our computer classroom. So this is just to kind of tell you um, there was no consistency in terms of how we recruited students into this survey. At the time we were doing this, um, we were not planning on it being any kind of a formal study. And so that was not something we put a lot of thought into at that time, other than we just wanted to get as many responses as we could possibly get. I asked IR for some other information. I asked them for things like how many of those students are Pell Grant eligible. Um, I asked for information about gender, um, whether or not students are first generation. And the things that I thought were most relevant to what we actually found are the two that I'm sharing here. So this number or the percentage of students who are considered underprepared based on their AccuPlacer scores and those that identify as rural. So the reason I was particularly interested in students who were underprepared is that was the feeling that we had in teaching first year students is that they're not coming to us with the levels of information literacy skill that we would expect them to have or that we think that they should have. So I wanted to know, are our students underprepared in other areas as well, besides what we actually see? The reason that I asked the question about rural students is because rural students might be particularly disadvantaged in terms of information literacy instruction because there are no school librarians or there are few school librarians in the rural schools. That's certainly the case in Eastern Oregon, you know, where we lost our school librarians, I'm not even sure, more than 10 years ago. And so our students are coming to us not having had that experience of having instruction from a school librarian. I do believe that students get information literacy instruction even with the absence of a school librarian. So I'm sure in a social studies class um, or an English class, any class where they have research-based or evidence-based writing instruction, um, they're going to be getting some instruction. But without the librarian, you don't have that point person who can ensure that the instruction that they're getting is in alignment with state and national standards for one, and you don't also, you also don't have a contact with the state library. So many of those um, teachers are unaware of the resources that are available to them through the state library. They have, for example, a database package that's free to all of the schools um, that they can access, and there's instructional modules, there's all kinds of good stuff in there. But when we've gone out and talked to teachers in some of these schools, they're not even aware that it's there because the contact person is usually the school librarian. So if you don't have one, it becomes a little bit of an issue. So ultimately, you can see we had 557 responses across the four years, so representing 41% of that total. What I've done here is I've organized the, re the questions that we asked in the survey according to theme. Um, and those themes are aligned with our instructional outcomes under the ACRL Information Literacy Competency Standards. So familiarity with the research process, knowing the steps of the research process, the ability to identify an appropriate research question. So in particular, looking at a topic and being able to devise a research question out of that topic that's appropriate um, for the college level. The ability to identify keywords. So given a search topic or question, can you extract the best keywords uh, to be able to have an effective search in a database? Knowledge of database search strategies, so that's specifically referred to advanced search strategies like using Boolean operators in your searching, truncation, that sort of thing. Um, recognition of information creation processes. So understanding information cycles or information timelines. So the difference in the publication process the editorial process and the review processes 
that a newspaper goes through as compared to a scholarly article or an ap academic book, for example. The ability to identify a scholarly source based on characteristics. Uh, the ability to identify a primary source based on the definition of a primary source. Knowledge of search tools, um, so just knowing what a subscription database is and what you would use it for. Knowledge of database tools, so within a subscription database, familiarity with those special um, tools and features like the thesaurus, controlled vocabulary, limiters, et cetera. Knowledge of book parts, so knowing the difference between a bibliography, an index, a table of contents, and so on, and that will be interesting to look at. Um, the ability to evaluate a website for quality. Reading comprehension, so given a, a piece, um, being able to extract key concepts from that. The ability to identify a source type by citation. So if I show you a citation for a journal article, can you correctly tell me that that's a journal article citation? Knowledge of copyright law and recognition of citation practices. So knowing under what circumstances you need to cite your sources. So those are all of the themes that we were looking at in our survey. The way that I have organized this presentation is I'm going to show you the Oregon School Library standards for 12th grade with the idea that we can consider what they should be able to do by the time they finish high school and then compare that with what we actually found, what they were actually able to do. The Oregon School Library standards were adopted in 2015. So they were not around at the time that we conceived of this survey. So this is really a post hoc analysis. Um, they include more than just information literacy. So there's three strands, including reading technology and information literacy. So we'll just focus on the information literacy part. And then each of the different standards is made up of indicators. And so I'll show you the, the five indicators that relate to information literacy. These were not mapped to grade levels. It was just this whole bunch of outcomes that students needed to be, do, be able to do in K-12. Um, over the last two years, the Oregon Association of School Libraries, OASL, and the Information Literacy Advisory Group of Oregon, ILAGO, has been collaborating to develop learning goals that are specific to each grade level. And they've actually gone all the way up to um, grade 14, so the second year in college. It's mainly been community college librarians who have been working on this, which is why it's grades K through 14. Um, these are not out yet. The, the, the standards were out in 2015, but the mapping to grade levels, that, that's gonna be released in spring of 2018. But I'm a past chair of the Information Literacy Advisory Group of Oregon, so I got a, an advanced look at those standards and was able to pull them to, for us to look at today. So this is what the standards look like. So the standard that relates to information literacy is use skills, resources, and tools to inquire think critically, and gain knowledge. And then there's five indicators. Develop, select, clarify, and use questions and strategies to search for information. So that's really about inquiry. Find, evaluate, and select appropriate sources to answer questions. So being able to actually search for information using a database or another type of tool, and then choose resources that are relevant and appropriate to your task. Select appropriate digital and other information tools for accessing content, so knowing when you would use a database versus when you would use a search engine or some other kind of tool. Evaluate information for accuracy, validity, importance, and bias. And then read, view, and listen to information in a variety of formats, so consuming information. <clears throat> so the first indicator, develop, select, clarify, and use questions and strategies to search for information. The learning goals for 12th grade are being able to generate and evaluate research questions. They should do that by the time they finish high school. Generate search terms and modify search strategies. So if you look at your research question, you can come up with keywords that are gonna produce an effective search. If it doesn't effect, produce an effective search, you can then modify your search. Use advanced search option techniques such as Boolean logic, limiters, or features in a database to structure a search strategy. Okay, so here is our first theme and results. So familiarity with the research process. So we were asking what is the most important first step in research? 
And the way to read this graph, so here's the total on the left-hand side. So this is the, the aggregate total across all the four years. And there's 2013, 14, 15, 16. And then these numbers on the y-axis are percents. So the blue one is always gonna be the correct answer. So all the graphs I'm gonna show you can be read in the same way. So the correct answer is <clears throat> know the research problem and you can see it's pretty good. So 62.3% were able to answer that correctly. No research problem is the first thing that you have to do in order to be able to do any of the other things. The next one is the ability to identify an appropriate research question. So given a topic, which of these selections would be an appropriate research question? And again, you can see by the blue, it looks pretty good. Um, we had 63 percent correct across those four years. That was really nice to see. That was one that actually surprised me a little bit because we're always talking about how students need so much help in developing research questions. Um, I know that many faculty will just provide students with topics or research questions because it's a lot of work to get students to that point where they can develop a research question. And I know being able to develop a research question on your own is a little bit different than being able to pick one out from a list. Um, but it was still encouraging for me to see. <clears throat> So given a um, topic, can students choose the most effective keywords in order to be able to be successful in a search? And only 34.8% were able to do this correctly. Um, all of those responses in red, um, the search terms that they chose, those would have gotten some results, but it would not necessarily have been the most effective search terms to use. Because when you're searching in a database, it's really different than searching in a search engine like Google where you have a really large index. You have to be much more precise and intentional with your search terms. Otherwise, you're, you're going to be restricting your results. So by using words like um, impact, for example, you would be requiring that system to only give you things that have the word impact. And so you're not going to get as many results as if you keep your keywords a little bit higher level. Knowledge of database search strategies. This one specifically referred to um, students understanding the concept of the Boolean or. So how you would use or in a search query. And you can probably already see by the graph, um, it was kind of a mixed bag. 31.4% got this one right. And this actually was a lot better than I thought it was gonna be. Every time I teach the concept of Boolean operators, I ask the class, have you ever heard of Boolean operators? And with the rare exception of math students or computer science students, they all say no. So this is something that's usually a totally unfamiliar concept for them. So I was surprised to see so many doing so well. But as you saw, it is an expectation that students would know how to search in this fashion in 12th grade. Okay, the next indicator, find, evaluate, and select appropriate sources to answer questions. So this is really um, more about that searching process. Um, the goals for 12th grade are recognize and use information sources appropriate to the task. So knowing when it's a good idea to use a news article versus using a, a peer-reviewed or scholarly journal article. Evaluate the usefulness and quality of sources. Um, so the first one, the first theme in alignment with those goals is recognition of information creation processes. So we're wanting students to know, um, you have to know a little bit about publication processes in order to know which types of sources are published more currently, which ones take longer to publish. And this is something that we actually um, spend a lot of time on in the Uni 101 class. So the correct answer is a journal to find the most recent information about drug abuse. So rather than a book, a dictionary, or an encyclopedia, which takes a lot longer to produce. And 53.5% of students responded correctly. The ability to identify a scholarly source. So given characteristics of sources, um, which one pertains to scholarly journals? 37.3%, um, so not so great. Um, and you can see the results are, they're all kind of close in a lot of areas, except for 2015. So for some reason, in 2015, nearly 60% of students got this right. I have no idea what that's about. We were really intentional about doing this survey during the first week of classes in fall term before we had actually done any instruction. 
um, relevant to any of these questions because we didn't want to skew the results. So I don't know what happened there because it went down again in 2016. The ability to identify a primary source. So based on the definition of a primary source, 51.2% of students correctly identified the definition of a primary source. Um, this is another one that kind of surprised me because it's usually a new concept for first year students. It's one they struggle with because of that word primary. It means so many different things. So they think it means the main source or the first source and they don't really understand the concept. Beyond that, primary sources are a little bit different in different disciplines. So in the sciences, for example, you might refer to the primary literature and you're talking about original research studies, whereas in um, history or in the humanities, primary sources might be a diary, an archival item, an interview. And so there's, it's ultimately still a first-hand account or an original source of information, but it's different in different subject areas and that's often a sticking point for students. Okay, the third indicator is select appropriate digital and other information tools for accessing content. And the learning goal for 12th grade is recognize that information systems have organized structures and can require subscriptions to access. And so this is really about not necessarily knowing what those organizational structures are, but knowing that they exist and that they have a purpose that affects your searching. And then there's also an access issue. So the subscription question, um, there's limited access to those resources. Knowledge of search tools, this question was really about do you know what a database is and what it is for? And you can see by those tall red bars, um, we didn't do great in this area. Only 32% of students correctly identified a database as the correct place to go for journal articles. And probably not surprising to any of us, um, what the majority chose was Google. Again, not surprising based on our experience, but considering the 12th grade learning goal, um, disappointing. Knowledge of database tools, so that's um, features in the database like a thesaurus, um, controlled vocabulary, limiters. Um, this one was another one that we didn't do so strong, 22.1%. And that's sort of, that can, a thesaurus used in this way is, is, is a little bit of a complex topic for some students to get their heads around. Knowledge of book parts. So this one is, um, this is the one that, I took this to a meeting over the summer, a library meeting, and this is the one that really shocked and surprised the most people. And I think it's because this kind of thing is something that we all learned probably in elementary school. So knowing what a bibliography is and how it's different from an index or a table of contents or a glossary. Um, some might argue, why do students really need to know this anymore when they're searching for information online rather than in books? But I would argue that understanding that organizational structure of printed material helps you to understand the organizational structures of online resources because it's all based on the printed material. So an index is an index. An index in a book is essentially the same structure as an index in a search engine or in a database. It's just how we search within that index that's different. Um, so the question is really about bibliography. So knowing what section of the book that you go to in order to consult other documents on the topic, you know, and that being the bibliography. <clears throat> Okay, so the fourth indicator, um, the learning goal that has to do with evaluating information is students should be able to determine the validity of information based on these factors. So based on authors' subject expertise, their scholarship or their practice, um, based on the purpose of the source, so was it created for commercial purposes or educational purposes, um, the audience and applicability, currency or timeliness, so how current is the information, how up to date is it, how sound and relevant is the argument, and then being able to, <clears throat> excuse me, differentiate between informal surveys and polls and scientifically reliable data sources. All things that we should be able to expect by the end of 12th grade. Asking students what factors that they would consider when evaluating a website for quality only 18.9% got that completely right. And this was a select all that apply 
question. So 18.9% is kind of disheartening, but 41.8% got it partially right. So that meant they selected some correct sources, just not, or some correct responses, just not all of them. 37.3% got it partially wrong, so they had some right responses and some wrong responses, and then 2% were just straight up wrong. So they were answering things like um, the placement in the list of results or how fast the website loads as an indicator of quality. <clears throat> All right, so the last indicator, read, view, and listen to information in a variety of formats. So this has to do with consuming information, being able to read critically. Using structures in different formats by skimming, looking for the main ideas, using visual cues to scan, and looking for specific facts or pieces of information. And I wanna mention that I, I really have truncated these learning goals. They're actually much longer and much more complex than what I'm showing you, but just for keeping concise and keeping my slides readable, I've, I've cut those down to just the essential pieces. So this would be like being able to take a scholarly article and figure out its organizational structure, so abstract, introduction, methods, data sources, conclusion, discussion, et cetera, <clears throat> and being able to find within that, you know, what are the key pieces you need to look for? Where are you gonna find the hypothesis within this article? Where, what's the difference in terms of the information you would find in the results versus in the discussion? The question that we asked had to do with, um, it was really more about reading comprehension and the ability to scan to extract relevant concepts. So we gave them a paragraph and we asked, what are the concepts that are addressed in this paragraph? And you can see it's looking blue, so it looks good. I think this was one of our better ones. 68% were able to correctly identify the concepts. And that was another thing that I was um, a little bit surprised to see that students did so well, because we're constantly criticizing students for not being able to read critically. And I know that being able to identify concepts in a paragraph is not exactly the same thing as reading critically, but it's, a, it's an important first step. We had several themes that were not aligned with the 12th grade learning goals, either because they're things that we would teach in college or they're things that they would have needed to have learned long before 12th grade. So the ability to identify a source type by citation. So if I show you these two citations right here, are you able to tell me which one refers to a journal article? And you don't have to say, but maybe think about it. <laughs> I thought about bringing clickers and testing you, but then I didn't really wanna know. <laughs> So it's A. How do we know that A is the journal citation? The volume and issue? Page numbers? Quotations around the title. So we have two titles. We have the title of the article and we have the title of the journal that it's in. 16.5% of students were able to correctly identify the journal article. And you only had the two choices? They actually had four choices, yeah but the other four were similar to, to B. <laughs> <clears throat> Knowledge of copyright law. So copyright law protects both published and unpublished works. That is a true or false question. It is true, 61.1 or 60.1% of students got that correct. You may reproduce without permission works for purposes such as criticism, comment, teaching, or academic work. So that's the fair use doctrine. That is also true but only 18.3% of students recognize that. Okay, recognition of citation practices. So this means understanding under what circumstances you need to cite your sources. So you need to cite your sources when you copy a whole entire paragraph, when you paraphrase in your own words, and when you use a direct quote, right? 19.0% of students selected all of those things as the times when you would need to cite your sources. The vast majority said you only need to cite your sources when you use a direct quote. I don't think this is particularly surprising to any of you who teach. Um, I know it's not surprising to me because we talk about this in our classes and it's always a little bit of a shocker to students that you have to cite when you paraphrase. Um, so this is a problem, this is a big problem. They should have learned this as soon as they started doing any kind of source-based or evidence-based research writing, you know, as far back as 
probably ninth grade. Um, so it's concerning that they're coming to us already not knowing that. And I think we all are working on making that better. Um, last year, there were a lot of conversations that were trickling back to us in the library um, about this particular problem. And so we started working on a project, a um, collaborative project to address this particular issue. So this project, it's a video called Ysite. Um, it was the brainchild of Rebecca Hartman who had this idea about getting a group of faculty from different disciplines together and having a conversation about citation practices and why we do it, trying to get at the, the underlying ideas about citation and why we value it. Um, so we got them all together at the end of, it was in finals week actually, at the end of spring term last year. We got Gib to come and film it. And over the fall, uh, Sally and I have been editing this video. Mostly Sally has been editing the video. And it's gonna be ready for you to see in December, but we wanted to debut um, the trailer for you today. So. Sally Milky, with the aid of iTunes, made that trailer for us. <laughs> OK. So that's coming in December, um, so that hopefully, the, the video, I should say, is not that action packed. <laughs> um, it really is just a conversation of faculty sitting around and talking. <laughs> but we wanted to capture your attention. But really, this is, this is like just a great example of cross-disciplinary inter-college collaboration that was really fun to do, I think Rhonda will agree, and it's, it's just been an exciting project, so I'm excited for that to come out. All right. There were a couple of other studies that used the same survey that we did. We made a few modifications to the survey, so it's not exactly the same. Um, the Canadian survey, so that was the original Mittermeier survey at the Universities of Quebec that I referred to earlier. That was who um, designed the survey. And then this was uh, La Trobe University in New South Wales, Australia, who used that same Mittermeier survey. And so we can kind of look at how their students did and how our students did. And because we made some modifications, not all of the themes really lined up. So I'm only sharing the themes that actually did match up. So search strategy and keyword choice, 86% um, of the Canadian students were able to be successful in that department, 77% in Australia, and we had 34.8%. Um, recognition of a citation, so identifying that a journal citation is indeed a journal citation, 36%, 24%, and then we had 16.5. Referencing an information source, so here we're a little bit more even, so this is knowing that you need to cite your sources under these different circumstances. Um, we had 19% as compared to their 28. Evaluation of the quality of an internet site, again, pretty close, 23, 24, we had 19. And then understanding of peer-reviewed journal articles, so being able to recognize the characteristics of a journal article. Um, we did really well by comparison, so 14%, 4%, and then we did 37.3%. Uh, yeah, Deanna. That's a good question. I would have to try that. 
But it's possible, yeah, because that was a big difference. It was around 30% or 20%, and then that one year was up to like 60%. Okay, so to conclude, I want to talk a little bit about what we could do moving forward. And the quotes that I'm showing you here, this is from the ACRL Framework for Information Literacy. So this is that document that guides our instructional program, um, which is relatively recent. It came out in 2015. And as I said, it, it really signaled a paradigm shift in terms of how we value and do information literacy instruction. Teaching faculty have a greater responsibility in designing curricula and assignments that foster enhanced engagement with the core ideas about information and scholarship within their disciplines. Librarians have a greater responsibility in identifying core ideas within their own knowledge domain that can extend learning for students in creating a new cohesive curriculum for information literacy and in collaborating more extensively with faculty. The framework envisions information literacy as extending the arc of learning throughout students' academic careers and as converging with other academic and social learning goals. And I think I can speak for all of us in the library faculty who do instruction when I say that we firmly believe that information literacy instruction needs to happen across the disciplines and across the student's educational experience. It should not just be relegated to the writing sequence or to the first year experience courses, which have no real context. It really needs to be discipline specific and it needs to be integrated throughout their whole entire experience. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. David. So the focus here was really kind of on the, the 12th graders and, 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 what, and what they know. Uh, did you take a look at transfer students as well? Uh, or do you have a feel for that? Uh, uh, yeah, we have a feel um, because of the upper level courses that we teach. We so far have not surveyed or done any sort of a pre-assessment with transfer students. But we teach um, Library 307 and Library 327 where we get a lot of online transfer students. In particular, um, we get a lot of business students, we get a lot of integrative studies students. And based on their experiences, I mean, there's certain conclusions we can draw. Most of them say they didn't know what we're teaching them before. They're 300 level courses, so it's not quite the same basic stuff. It's, it's a little bit more advanced and it's a little bit more focused on um, online research. Um, but the majority of them say things like, I wish I had had this as a freshman, you know, acknowledging that they did not learn this before. I have one. The other universities used the same time frame for when they administered the survey as we did, so that's an exact. Uh, More or less. They did it early in the term, but I don't know if it was within the first week of the term. But yes, very early on before they'd actually done any instruction. All right, thank you. <laughs>